Amen. Good to see y'all this morning. You feeling better, Brother Roy? Good, good. Well, we've been in the book of Daniel, and last week we were in chapter 2, and we're still in chapter 2 this week. But last week we hit a few of the high spots. You know, we saw that uh, Nebuchadnezzar put a little test on his wise men and found out they weren't so wise. Uh, we saw that uh, there's power in prayer, and that should be our first resort. Uh, we talked about some of the dangers of I. Um, yeah. And we learned that there is a God in heaven. You know, uh, and as we go through this chapter a little bit, Nebuchadnezzar is going to realize this. Uh, and we talked about that everything that we are and everything that we have is because of God. You know, that's, that's where we're at. Um, the world we live in, not so much. You know, uh, <laughs> me and Sally's been watching some stuff, and by the year 2050, the world government want zero carbon emissions. Well, how is that possible? You know, I mean, they're wanting to cut out meat production. You would have enough meat to have four pounds a year. They want to do away with uh, any fossil fuel vehicle by 2050. Any. Electric airplane, that sounds good. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Um, it, and it's just so strange as to how they look. And it's to save the earth. The earth don't need saving. So this going to be destroyed. The book says so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they want to do with, away with is methane gas. And the other gas they want to do with away with is CO2, which is what we exhale. I'm just saying that's what these people are agreeing upon to save the earth. The earth is not savable. Okay? But anyway, it's just the, it's just the, the things that they come up with. I don't, I don't understand. Um, there's two primary trains of thought. We stopped in verses 42 and 43. And there's two primary trains of thought that scholars like to take. Um, you know, when I come up here to teach or whatever, I bring you things to ponder, to further investigate, uh, to pray about, and to study. Because the things we hit, I mean, we can take one word and spend a lot of time on one word. But it's up to us to study these things out to see whether they be true. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 tells us to study to show, well, tells me to study to show thyself approved under God. Not under anybody else, but under God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's the end of that verse. But the next verse says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And we live in a society that has some Crazy idea. So it's up to us to hash it out. Um, in Acts 17, verses 10 through 12, y'all can read that later, but it talks about the Bereans, where Paul and Silas went to the Bereans, and they were received because the Bereans had a readiness of mind, you know. But it's, they still search the scriptures to daily to see whether those things are true. And it said many people were saved because of that. So it's our job to look at these things. I'm going to read you a, a little bit of scripture here. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. said, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. You say, what's that got to do with me? Well, in Revelation chapter 5, you probably want to read that whole chapter, but in verses 9 and 10, it says, through the blood of Jesus, us, through the, his blood, have been made kings and priests unto God. So it's an honor for us to search out a matter. And 
You know, we've got a lot of available tools to search out these matters. Um, so we're expected to study these things and search them out and so we can show ourselves approved workmen under God. Okay? Um, I'm going to take you... Well, let me give you one more thing. And I've told you this before. Anybody that's had class with me has heard this, but... The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. You can see pictures of Jesus Christ and his salvation all through the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed unto us. See, they didn't have anything but the Old Testament. So they, you had to use the Old Testament to prove Jesus Christ to them. Okay? So always keep that in mind. But y'all know I'm big on words, I'm big on statistics. Uh, but the verse that got me started searching for the meaning of words, and the reason I'm going to, we'll get back to the meaning of words here shortly. Um, let's just turn there. It's Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Before we read anything, I want you to think about what the word perfect means to you. Perfect. Okay. You know, I really didn't want to go deep this deep into this subject here. But the more I studied on it, the more the Lord pushed me. So that's the way we're going this week. Let's see here. Six and nine. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. About 17 or 18 years ago, that word perfect just left off the page to me. Um, perfect. You know, now, in the current state of mind I have, when I read perfect, I think of Jesus Christ. You know, seeing Well, that is what got me started down this path. And I can't, and in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 13, it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it it is folly and shame unto him. Okay? And there was a feller in the late 1500s named Edwin, Edmund Spencer. He said, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. So if I condemn something before I even understand it, according to the Bible, in Proverbs, it's folly and shame to me. So, if we go back to this word perfect, it means without spot, without blemish, complete, whole, undefiled, and untainted, a pure bloodline. So Noah wasn't perfect in my thinking of Jesus Christ as perfect. He, it was his bloodline that was untainted and perfect. Okay? And we'll get deeper into this. Let's make sure I'm not skipping over anything. So, let's go to Daniel chapter 42, I mean chapter 2, verse 42. Let's just start in 41. And it said, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, pot of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part of the clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, or brittle. Uh, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So, clay is H2635, and it's Aramaic. It's a masculine noun, and it's spelled H-A-S-A-P. 
and it's clay or a pot shirt. Clay, I don't know if y'all have ever worked with it, were when I was a boy and we still had all these wood stoves and stuff, Dad would get this yellow clay and we'd mix it up and we'd pack it around the stove pipes and stuff like that. Or uh, potter's clay, if you've noticed it, it's malleable, can be worked. If you look up this type of clay, a lot of times it's used as righteousness, as a righteous type thing. You know, we're the, we're the clay on the potter's wheel and God, God is the potter. Okay, well, that's one type of clay. Um, we're moldable and usable, supposed to be. But if we go to miry clay, it's H2917, and it's also an Aramaic, and it's spelled T-I-N and pronounced teen. It's also a masculine noun, but it's made from dust, uh, just like mud, just plain old mud. You know, Oh, soupy mud won't stick to you, but clay, boy, you drag it around with you forever. <laughs> I've, I've had it built up on my feet till I couldn't walk and have to go find somewhere to scrape it off. So we're talking about two different kinds of clay in this set of scripture here. And I had never seen this till I started studying this again. I've been through Daniel a lot, but I've never paid any attention to this. So when we get down here to verse 43, to the feet and the toes, historically, by this statue that we're talking about, we're approaching the end of time, or the end of the time of the Gentiles, when we get down to these feet and toes. Um, so this is one train of thought out of two that people take on this set of scripture right here. And we'll probably only get through one today, so we're going to work this train of thought and it's very plausible, okay? Um, Matthew 24, verse 37, and this is Jesus speaking. It says, As the day of no war, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And <laughs> are we there yet? Well, we're closer than we were yesterday, you know. And if you look biblically, around the world, you can, you can pull up... Uh, Earthquake, there's a live earthquake monitor you can watch. Uh, you can pull up a USGS thing of the volcanoes. There's more volcanoes erupting than there have been, and I can't remember how many years. It's a lot. Volcano, and it says there's going to be earthquakes and things in diverse places. Well, there's more earthquakes and volcanoes erupting right now than there ever has been. Okay? Um... I am no prophet, but he'd give us a few road signs to look at as we went along. Um, so, we're closer than we ever have been. So let's go back to verse 43, when it says, As whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. That's that's a little kind of weird to me. Um, they here is used as a personal pronoun. Uh, so the they here is something other than the seed of men. Right? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So we're talking two different things. All right? And it is kind of weird, and it is kind of out in left field a little bit, but if we can believe in a virgin birth, you know, a resurrection of the dead, walking on water and feeding 5,000, it's not so far-fetched, right? Okay. Okay. We're going to go to the days of Noah that Christ is speaking about back here. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 6 again. My old index Bible has me spoiled. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 
And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives all of which they chose. All right. Sons of God. Sons of God here, if you look it up in the Hebrew, is spelled B-E-N-E and then capital H-A and then capital E-L-O-H-I-M. B'nai Ha Elohim. And it's always, almost always used referring to angels. Okay? Uh, angels are a direct creation of God. Okay? We're sons of Adam. All right? We're, we're not a direct creation of God. Um, and I'm going to get through this here. Uh, Brother Tony, would you mind going to John chapter 1? Yeah, I believe it's St. John. Sometimes I'm bad about writing that down. Uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, I believe it is. Yep, that's it. Okay, we are given power to become the sons of God through our belief in Jesus Christ. All right, we're no longer a son of Adam. We're reborn and we're a son of God or daughter or however. Um, all right. Uh, ben Hai Elohim Elohim is used a lot in the Old Testament to describe God the big G not little G uh, Genesis 1 and 1 it says in the beginning God you look it up in the Hebrew it's Elohim okay so we're seeing something here that's taking place that there is something that is not of this world coming down here and mingling with people. Um, and it is not my desire to confuse anybody or to set a stumbling block here. I'm just putting out a point of view for you to study further because the war that rages that we don't see is a lot deeper than we understand. A lot deeper. Um, and we'll go to that verse where it all started toward the end of this. Um, so there's references uh, to Ben Ha Elohim in Job 1 and 6, Job 2 and 1, Job 38 and 7, Luke 20 and 36. And we're not going to read all those, but read that for your homework. Um, and in Job, it talks about where the sons of God came and presented themselves before God. And so on. But that's Ben Ha Elohim. Um, in the Septuagint, which is what the Old Testament was translated from into Greek, uh, it was Hebrew. And a group of Hebrew scholars in the third century BC uh, translated this into very precise Greek. And Y'all, we've seen how precise Greek is. There's like five word, there's like five definitions of the word love. You know, it's very precise. Um, if you go back here, it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Well, the daughters of men here, that Hebrew was been off Adam, daughters of Adam. Okay. So the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they were fire, and they took them wives of all the which they chose. Uh, let's just read three and four. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Then it goes here, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, they became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. 
So the giants here that it's speaking of, the word is Nephilim. And it means the fallen one. And it comes from the root word in the fall. To fall, to be cast down, to fall away, to desert. The to, the, the to desert is pretty interesting. And giants comes from the word gigas, which means earthborn. All right? So we have some kind of strange thing happening here where giants are the offspring, I guess would be the right word. You know, product of it. And I, like I said, I didn't want to get too deep in this, but I just felt pushed to do that, and that's what I'm going to do. Because um, you need to know certain, and I'm not saying all this is correct. I'm just saying this is one point of view, okay? And I can see where a lot of it, a lot of it is plausible. Um, but to be ca- to fall, be cast down, to fall away, to desert, Gygus means earthborn. You know, that's where giants come from. Um, let's go to the book of Jude. Now, this is the Lord's brother. And he's drawing a parallel between this time and what Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. Um, if I can find it again. Yeah, here we go. It's Jude, verse 6 and 7. And it said, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner you know, we always forget about, we always remember Sodom and Gomorrah a bit, but said it's Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plains that he destroyed. I think there was like six. I'm not sure. but About them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So now, where this point of view comes from, out of verse 43, is we're thinking the toes here or is the end of the age. Okay, so in Noah's day, this is what started the end of the age, okay, before the flood. Um, and, you know, me and Jimmy's talked about Noah a lot. We get discouraged at a little bit, you know. I mean, this man preached 120 years, right? He didn't see a soul saved other than his own household. Um, so, Jude, the Lord's brother, go ahead, brother. <laughs> um, he's drawn a parallel between Sodom and Gomorrah and the fallen angels offspring the fallen angels basically that, that caused this offspring for pursuing strange flesh well the word habitation over here I believe it's in Jude yep but left their own habitation this word is only translated into this word two times in the book that I know of. And the word is called Oketerian. And it represents our glorified heavenly body is what an Oketerian is. Okay? And it's what we're longing for. We're wanting our glorified body. We want out of this thing. And we want our glorified body. What we're looking for. Well, the angels already had that. But some of these angels shed that so that they could come down here and intermingle with the human race. Okay? That's what this is telling us. Uh, so, it, since you're right there, Tony, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. And Brother Mark, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead. Chapter uh, 5, verses 1 and 2, I'm sorry. Brother Mark, if you wouldn't mind, I think it's Second Peter, chapter two, verses four and five. I think. When you get there, just read that, brother. Well, 
that house there is Okatirian. We're wanting our glorified body. That's what we're that's what we're striving for. That's our end result. Our perfected body. Now how that works, I don't know. But that's what I'm looking for. But you mean the way I understand it, there's no more pain, there's no more hunger. Hey, I'm hungry twenty four seven. David over. But that's what we're striving for. But these fallen angels were so enticed by the human race. This is Keith's take on this, okay? By what we've got here, they were so enticed that they were willing to shed that. Give that up. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's some serious business. You're giving up an eternal house for that? Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Right. Satan had. Yeah. Right. And do it. And do it. And do it. And then you can you can see a whole you can see a whole world around us that does it. We're given through our faith in Christ the power to become sons of God. Given, if we'll accept it. But go ahead. Oh no. Go, I mean, hey, that's great. Talk. Um, we're given this power to become sons of God. But most people will never take it the way I read the book. And it says, hell enlarges itself daily. You know? Um, there's just some real good points to ponder in here. The powers that Satan has over his subjects or whatever, this world, uh, it's an interesting time. Uh, so they gave up a perfected body to, do, to perceive strange flesh is basically what I get from this. What, what Second Peter got to say there, brother? Uh, chapter two, four, and five. Yeah. Okay, the thought behind that, saving Noah and his family was an untainted bloodline. Okay? All right. Well, that was the thought behind this whole thing, is this untainted bloodline. That's the reason he saved Noah. No, not because Noah was perfect, as in my mind, he was perfect. Okay? Because of an untainted bloodline. But I'm going to show you where all this mess started. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it says, I will put enmity, which is intense hatred is what that word means, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is where the war started, right here. Satan knew that he had a limited amount of time to do away with the bloodline that could supply Christ. Go, go, buddy, yeah. No. Oh, yes. Yes. And we'll find that out as we read more. He found grace in the sight of God. Right. Yeah, my, my view of perfect is Jesus Christ, the complete package. My, that's, that's my benchmark. I fail. I might never get there, but I've got to strive for that benchmark. That's our benchmark is Jesus Christ. Um, so this is where the whole mess started, according to this train of thought. Okay, um, but what a lot of people will read in this, and I, I've talked to other people about it, says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, so Satan's going to have a seed, 
which they believe, that all the scholars I've read, is the Antichrist. Okay? All right? So a lot of people forget about that. When the Antichrist comes out on the scene, the way I understand it, he's going to have the answers to fix everything and lead a lot of people down the wrong path. Just like he led all these fallen angels down the wrong path, you know? Um, so, the biggest thing I think we can take across, away from this is the grace of God, the perfection of Christ, and our duty to study this stuff and know it. Because there's coming a day when we'll need to know it. You know, me and the preacher were talking. We forget so many things. But it tells us not to worry about it. But the Spirit will bring it back to our remembrance. But if we've never put it in there, he can't bring it back for us to remember. You know, and I've been in many situations. I ain't that smart. But boy, I had the answer. I didn't have the answer. The good Lord supplied the answer. You know, and as we talked, he said, you know, you're right. He said, I've been caught on the back foot and really was taken aback for a minute, but then the answer came to me. Well, the answer came to you because somewhere along the line, you've taken that in and the Spirit was able to bring it back to you, okay? So it's very important that we study this stuff. Um, you know, a lot of it doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. You've got to know Jesus first. You know, that's first and foremost. And a lot of these things will work themselves out anyway through him, not through anything that I can do or you can do, but through him. I mean, we've been, you think about what we've been given. We've been having the power to become sons of God. That's a, man could preach a sermon on that, you know. So we're going to stop here, and I think we've run this about as far down the rabbit hole as I need to, I believe. Um, and then we'll go on another train of thought next week and hopefully finish up chapter 2, maybe get into chapter 3. So if you want to read ahead, uh, do that. And we'll take a little break and come back.